Uh, thanks uh, for that introduction, Darshan. Thanks, Mike and Mansoor, for uh, having me. I, I don't have any uh, disclosures. <clears throat> uh, because of the nature of the talk, I have about 14 minutes. I'll focus on three objectives, and here are the questions we're going to try to answer. Uh, what is heart failure with preserved EF? What patients are most at risk for HFPEF or heart failure with preserved EF? And how do you diagnose HFPEF? And what are some of the challenges surrounding the diagnosis? I don't have enough time for the case, so I'll come back to it and may use it perhaps while we're uh, having a bit of a discussion. So moving right on to what is HFPEF. The key is it's a clinical definition. This is from the European Society of Cardiology, and it's the definition I use when I'm trying to explain this condition. Um, it consists of four components. You really need to have symptoms and signs of heart failure. That is key. As you know, your ejection fraction is going to be greater than or equal to 50%. And there should be evidence of elevated LV filling pressures, um, either invasively or non-invasively. And non-invasively would be using echo parameters or biomarkers like natriuretic peptides. The problem, though, is that not every single patient with HEFPEF will have elevated um, LV filling pressures at rest, and that this definition doesn't really account for people who only have symptoms that manifest with exercise. Uh, so no definition is perfect, but that's probably what's missing from this one. And when you're talking about HEFPEF, it's also very important to carefully exclude mimickers, which I find sometimes to be very challenging. Um, things to consider would be high output heart failure, uh, for which there's an overlap with even obesity, uh, pericardial diseases, and as Mansour mentioned, lung disease with consequent right-sided heart failure can mimic HEFPEF and isn't exactly necessarily HEFPEF, uh, as well as renal failure. So when we think about the definition, um, we also recognize that we're moving away from um, a one-size-fits-all approach for HEFPEF. Uh, this figure is taken from a fantastic review uh, by one of the um, uh, speakers to come, and it, it really discusses the idea that the old way of thinking about HEFPEF was it's about hypertension and diastolic heart failure. And the current or prevailing concept is that it's, well, a little more complicated than that, and it's, it's about inflammation and coronary um, microvascular changes, and this leads to HEFPEF. But now what we recognize is that HEF, heart failure is a spectrum, and HEFPEF is one of those, is in that spectrum, and that there are really more likely, particularly in HEFPEF phenotypes of patients, and that these um, pathophysiological changes interact with age and comorbidities and lifestyle uh, and, and genetics, and, and that's sort of more of a way to think about uh, heart failure. So which patients are most at risk for HEFPEF? I could have an entire hour on this component of the talk, uh, but uh, I'll put up uh, you know, this slide, and, and as you can see, who's at risk for HEFPEF? As you get older, and I'll tell you why you're at risk for HEFPEF, obesity and physical inactivity are risk factors for HEFPEF, and I'll touch on those a little bit more. I would love to spend more time talking to you about why diabetes and coronary artery disease and hypertension are risk factors for HEFPEF, as well as the interaction with atrial fibrillation and chronic kidney disease. As you can see, though, what's overwhelming about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is that's a lot of people. 50% um, of heart failure is, is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and it's not surprising to see why when you take into account how many people are at risk for it. I really like this figure, but I also am frustrated by this figure because what it's trying to tell us is that we really should reconsider heart failure based on phenotypes. The idea is, is that while hypertension is central to HEFPEF, there are other clusters of people who may or may not have hypertension. And, and in this uh, paper, they talk about the idea that um, there are, there's a cohort or a phenotype of patients and based on age, and then comorbidities like coronary artery disease, and there's a phenotype uh, around obesity, and one where the predominant um, presentation is actually with high pulmonary pressures, and that there are interactions between these clusters of patients and other comorbidities such as diabetes and lung disease and renal disease, as well as atrial fibrillation. So as I said, I could spend a lot of time just talking about risk factors. So I'll, I'll talk on uh, just very briefly on aging and why this is a risk factor. Um, I think 
it's, it's known that there are neurohormonal um, changes that can happen with aging related to angiotensin II and endothelin and, and pro-inflammatory states. And then um, the last point about arterial stiffness is one where there are distinctions between uh, men and women that can account for differences in heart failure uh, presentations, uh, such that you know ventricular vascular uncoupling um, and the uh, leading to diastolic dysfunction is seen uh, in in women uh, in different ways than men. So. I mentioned obesity and I mentioned physical inactivity as risk factors for HFPEF. Here is uh, why. Um, it's not obesity per se, more so than central obesity and particularly elevated um, waist circumference. Studies have shown that the obesity paradox is actually taken off the table when you look at uh, central obesity. And, and the reason for that is there are major determinants of arterial stiffness, chronic systemic inflammation, and altered myocardial metabolism, which are all uh, potentially going to lead to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And then you take into account uh, other conditions, such as sleep apnea, which can compound the problem. But I wanted to show you this figure as well, because uh, this is a very interesting study that talks about the impact of physical activity. And what the study of the authors show is that definitely they saw uh, the, uh, an association between an elevated BMI and your risk of HFPEF. But interestingly, and that's what you see in the figure on the left, as your physical uh, activity increases, your risk of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction decreases, and that's different than for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, suggesting that physical inactivity in itself can contribute and is associated with the development of HFPEF. And importantly, this was adjusted for age and sex and other important um, uh, covariates like uh, financial status, income, and, and uh, socioeconomic status as well. So, so very interesting, and I think it speaks to some of the, I'm not talking about treatment, but it speaks to the importance of, of the consideration of treating obesity uh, when you have a patient with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and also thinking about obesity and physical inactivity as risk factors for HFPEF. So why does all this talk on, um, the phenotype of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction matter. Um, in addition to understanding the clusters of patients and how they may be treated differently or the pathophysiological differences between them, what I think is important to impress upon everybody is that different phenotypes are associated with different prognoses. It's often uh, discussed that, well, people don't really die of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, they die of other comorbidities. Um, but this is, from, uh, this is from the charm preserved population. They took the cohort and then looked at this cohort according to different subgroups that they, they basically created phenotypes. And what was very interesting, over a short period of time, over 50 months, as you can see at the bottom, uh, there's um, two cr uh, curves that are quite different than the other subgroups when it comes to their risk of, of um, uh, their uh, survival free from uh, heart failure and death. And what you see is that those two groups, subgroup F and subgroup C, I think are important to recognize. One is one that we might think of as being more high risk, that is uh, subgroup F with mostly women, median age of 82, lower BMI, higher rates of AFib, chronic kidney disease and anemia. We've all seen this patient phenotype. But I think it's important to highlight subgroup C, which has an equally poor prognosis, and that is younger, slightly younger patients, median age of 70, 60% 60 of women with an overwhelmingly high rate of obesity of 75% with a BMI above 30. And then, uh, of course, important um, uh, risk factors associated with that in diabetes and coronary artery disease. So uh, understanding HFPEF from a phenotype perspective is, is not only important for diagnosis, but as I'm showing you here, for prognosis. So in the last five minutes, I want to just talk about how you diagnose HFPEF. And as someone who does diagnose HFPEF, sometimes I get it wrong, because the diagnosis of HFPEF is actually very challenging. Um, 
We start with biomarkers as being one area where um, uh, we can look at them for uh, evaluating a patient with uh, unexplained dyspnea who you might suspect have, has HEFPEF, but they're actually imperfect. Uh, and, and the problem with them is that they are first of all lower in patients with HEFPEF than HEFREF, and it's not uncommon to have normal natriuretic pep peptides um, in the presence of obesity, in which case you actually can't exclude a diagnosis of HEFPEF based on that. Um, also importantly is natriuretic peptides can go up with atrial fibrillation, and so you may have a patient with AFib that doesn't actually have HEFPEF, or they may have have PEF as well as AFib and contributing to the natriuretic peptides you see. When we think about reasons why natriuretic peptides don't go up as much in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, what that figure shows us there is um, really part of it has to do with less uh, wall stress. Uh, and release of the natriuretic peptides, as well as obesity. Um, genetics seem to play a role in BNP deficiency. Uh, race, such as uh, African uh, ancestry, may play a role, as well as changes in insulin resistance uh, and androgen or other um, hormone levels. And while natriuretic peptides are, are certainly not a perfect biomarker, they're still a very important biomarker, and this comes from the uh, American, or sorry, the Heart Failure Association of the European Society of Cardiology, and it's part of an algorithm. Uh, but the key thing is, is that for a breathless patient who you have completed a clinical assessment and it's compatible with HEFPEF, signs and symptoms of, of congestion or low output, your standard diagnostic tests of course include natriuretic peptides as well as an ECG, a chest x-ray, and echo. Um, and in those patients where that's the suggestive um, diagnosis, uh, that's great. But sometimes this initial investigation is not sufficient, and you have to consider additional uh, investigations. And one additional investigation that may be of great use is non-invasive diastolic stress testing or a stress echo, um, because this can unmask HEFPEF. Um, what I'm showing here is the bike that is the, the most um, appropriate way to evaluate a diastolic function uh, with a stress echo. Um, and the idea is in these two figures is that you have two patients who start out with actually identical impaired relaxation and mitral inflow and annular velocities at rest. But the first patient, patient B, um, has a completely normal uh, response to exercise in terms of their um, mitral inflow velocities and tissue doppler velocities such that uh, you would consider them not ha having a, uh, a diagnosis consistent with heart failure with preserved DF. However, the second patient, um, importantly, um, there is a rise in the mitral inflow velocity, but the tissue a Doppler or the marker of relaxation of the ventricle um, doesn't change such that your ratio goes up and this is really suggestive of elevated LV filling pressures with exercise. The sensitivities and specificities depending on the, the study you look at is around 75% ballpark, like some studies 70, some studies closer to 80, but certainly a very useful tool to have when you're trying to understand whether your patient has HEFPEF. Now this is where um, it gets really interesting because this is what I often see, which is the idea that when hef the diagnosis remains still uncertain, uh, it's important to consider right heart catheterization um, because you can diagnose overt heart failure as well as unmask heart failure with preserved EF. So overt heart failure, you'll see elevated filling pressures at rest for uh, for some patients, and that's fantastic if your physical exam or biomarkers weren't helpful, but it does unmask heart failure with preserved ejection fraction when you add a key component, which is exercise. And so for some patients, when you have uh, assessed their filling pressures with rest, it's not until you perform exercise with your right heart cath that you see um, uh, that they do have an inappropriate rise in their filling pressures with exercise. And just for the sake of time, I'll just tell you in that figure that it matters um, what type of patient you are in that those patients who have normal filling pressures at rest but their pressures go up with exercise, they're in that orange curve there. They have um, 
it's important for their uh, prognosis as well, and it impacts their uh, time to events. Um, and they're not as high risk as the patients with elevated filling pressures at, with rest and activity, but certainly unmasking this group of HEFPEF is important. So bottom line, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, it's a clinical diagnosis of signs and symptoms of heart failure. You should have um, uh, findings of left-sided filling pressures that are elevated at rest or with exertion. The key is consider exertion if you don't have an answer. Um, in particular, I wanted to highlight obesity and physical inactivity as risk factors and contributors to the development of HEFPEF, but as you all know, there are many risk factors. And lastly, once you know your rejection fraction, obviously you're going to conduct a physical assessment and get your biomarkers, recognizing the limitations of them, but you should consider diastolic stress testing. And even a right heart cath in the right patient where there is clinical uncertainty, and as I showed you, um, make, getting the diagnosis right matters not only for treatment but also for prognosis. Thanks for your attention.